Hello, uh, welcome everyone to this online book launch of Introducing Vigilant Audiences. So, um, so today we have, oops, apologies. Uh, so today we have with us um, the co-editors of the book. Um, so first we have Daniel Trottier. Um, Daniel Trottier is an associate professor in global digital media at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Uh, he's leading a five-year project at the moment on digital, digital media and vigilante activities, uh, which is funded by the Dutch Research Council. We also have with us Rashid Gabdul uh, Hakov, uh, who is a PhD candidate also in the Department of Media and Communication at Erasmus University uh, in Rotterdam, and he is currently investigating vigilantism, surveillance, privacy, and internet governance in autocratic contexts. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we have Xian Huan today, who is also a PhD can candidate at the Department of uh, Media and Communication at Erasmus University, and she studies digital vigilantism and online culture in China. Uh, so thank you again uh, for being with us today, and thank you also to the to those that turned into uh, our book lunch. Uh, so just a quick thing before uh, we go ahead and I leave the floor to the co-editors. So uh, please make sure you have your uh, microphones muted. Uh, this session will be recorded and will upload on our YouTube channel, so you will be able to re-watch it in case you want to go over the questions again. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I leave the floor to you. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, I'm just going to do screen share so that you can see <clears throat> our visuals. Um, is that working? Yes, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so I want to spend yeah the next ten to fifteen minutes uh, just briefly uh, outlining the book, um, and in particular, it's uh, scholarly but also it's societal relevance. Um, and I think, given the context that we're in right now. <clears throat> Uh, one topic that uh, is certainly grabbing our attention is uh, pandemic-based shaming. So the book fundamentally is about people being targeted by online mobs, uh, vigilant audiences, vigilant publics. And the most recent example of this uh, would be uh, pandemic-based shaming. And in particular, this individual who's essentially the most hated person in Australia at the moment. Um, you might have heard of this story where, <clears throat> as a result of uh, misrepresenting what they were doing in the pizza shop. Uh, this triggered a, a six-day uh, lockdown, um, and this was attributed entirely to this person, perhaps a bit unfairly, um, and this person was the target of a lot of denunciation and vitriol by uh, the state's uh, premier, uh, who was quoted as being livid with this individual. Uh, the press, and in particular the tabloid press, uh, played a big role in um, sort of stoking these flames. And of course, online individuals uh, were extremely angry. So we saw uh, instances of uh, denunciation, threats, uh, hate speech, um, trying to get this person fired, trying to get this person kicked out of the country. And when reporting on this case, um, interestingly, uh, the Daily Mail makes reference to online comments and sort of online activity as um, an instance of this. And of course, it also cultivates uh, this kind of speech and this kind of activity in its own unmoderated comment section. So this is just a small slice of the, uh, the, the many ways in which we see online mobs and online uh, justice seeking um, as a kind of global force and as seemingly unstoppable. And I think it's important to really underline the fact that um, vigilant audiences in, in particular are both covered by the press, but also cultivated by the media more generally. So the relations that they have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, institutions, vis-a-vis -vis the government, is a lot more complicated than we might initially think. So in terms of why we wrote this book, and I think it's important to note that, that when it comes to this book, it's not just me as the editors, but also uh, the authors, the contributors as well. Um, one of our primary motivations was, of course, to understand how and why people turn to digital tools, uh, not only to seek justice, but also as a form of uh, entertainment and amusement. And of course, based on the harm leveraged against others. Uh, so in particular, we were concerned with observing and contributing to global debates over whether this is a positive development, um, under which conditions might we find this to be acceptable. And of course, the we in that statement is um, yeah, changing depending on which chapter you look at. Uh, some related questions in the, include uh, the degree to which online justice seeking can be proportionate. Can it deliver an appropriate and an acceptable amount of uh, punishment, or does it always exceed anybody's expectations? Uh, in terms of the presence of shaming, uh, 
Uh, is there the possibility for reintegrative shaming um, within online justice seeking, or is it always exclusionary? Does it always cross a line? This, these are questions for which you see varying answers depending on which chapter you focus on, which context. Uh, so the concern with scholarly inquiry, but also some of these more normative and societal uh, questions. Uh, of course, the book taps into the idea that this is a very much uh, global manifestation. So reconciling these kind of global mediated patterns with local cultures or local histories, and local contexts. Uh, we're looking at uh, cases in places like China, Morocco, Slovenia, uh, North America, of course. Um, in doing so, it also uh, crosses scholarly and disciplinary boundaries. Uh, so looking at literature on vigilantism, sort of a conventional kind, criminology, but also cultural studies, humanities, visual studies, uh, also engaging with legal frameworks. And in doing so, um, uh, we also confront uh, research and ethical dilemmas. So not just ethical dilemmas in terms of negotiating whether these are just forms and practices, but also our own steps as researchers in terms of bearing witness to these types of events and the role of personal information when it comes to uh, reporting on these cases without bringing further undue harm to uh, any of these targets or people involved. So each chapter considers instances of online shaming in the context of particular cultures, technical practices, and public acceptance. But when looking through these chapters, um, just browsing through the titles, we see particular themes which unite these chapters. And so in looking at these themes, um, and this is sort of the order in which the chapters are presented, uh, we first see a cluster of chapters that focus especially on entertainment. Uh, so this is not just cases where public entertainers are targeted uh, for offenses, including in their private life, uh, but we also see a certain mobilization of fandoms uh, as pre-existing communities. So as opposed to a community spontaneously coming together, coalescing and mobilizing, we're talking about communities which already have their own sort of internal rules, regulations, doxa, uh, to use a term uh, that Simona draws upon, um, and then are sort of further launched into the public sphere. So these chapters consider both powerful Hollywood figures, authors, but also artists who are more on the margins of their respective communities and societies, as well as a range of influencers, a term that I think many of us um, above the age of 30 are coming to terms with and struggling. So influencers with a sizable digital following as well. A second set of chapters considers how citizenship and broader notions of national identity are produced and expressed through mediated denunciation. And again, a term like citizen, in contrast to a term like civilian, speaks to an us and a them, uh, the possibility of exclusion of, and marginalization of others. Uh, in particular, in terms of the defense of shared national values, shared identity, or shared territory. So the chapters you see here uh, engage with cases and developments in Russia, in Morocco, as well as in Canada and France, and the sort of particular defense of like the West, the sort of amorphous entity. All three cases in particular speak to a negotiative process where we see what is acceptable is in the process of being sort of shaped in real time, uh, reflecting existing political relations, but also media affordances. The next set of chapters considers a more progressive uh, development, uh, namely the denunciation of hate speech. This is something that we can consider as a sort of tipping point, uh, both in the United States um, and Europe, but also globally. So responding to a polarized public sphere and uh, turning to social media, turning to digital tools to take a clear side. Um, many of these chapters address in particular the 2007 white nationalist Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Uh, Tara's in particular um, very much zooms in on uh, this development as, as very sort of, yeah, yeah, sort of a, a chapter in history, actually. Uh, we also see uh, Moika and Pika's uh, article on anti-refugee rhetoric in Slovenia. Um, and David uh, touching upon uh, these um, cases as well. Uh, this is once again a process through which we're negotiating the conditions under which this kind of denunciation is acceptable and thinking about this as practices which are very much developing in real time. 
Finally, uh, we typically think of vigilantes as sort of organic bottom-up manifestations which challenge police work, um, undermine the legitimacy. Yet we see that the relation between vigilantes, audiences, and police is more and more sort of a regular and normalized uh, occurrence. So on the one hand, we see instances where police are making sense of conditions under which this is possible and acceptable. Uh, these are themes which Liana and Albert are exploring in their chapter as well, uh, with police and sort of local authorities and law enforcement more generally. Um, on the other hand, we also see developments which are much more on sort of the, the, the cutting edge or already transcending um, to entertainment as a mobilizing force. Uh, so we're looking at instances of police activity mobilizing uh, audiences, not just for justice seeking, but really uh, as a form of amusement at the expense of uh, people who have been um, photographed in mugshots. Uh, so Sarah's chapter on uh, the Maricopa County in Arizona, um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, you know that name, uh, I think provides uh, some really interesting things here as well. So that was a bit of a whirlwind tour in terms of uh, the themes and um, the topics which come up in this book. Now, before moving on to our question and an audience, or an answer session with the audience and with uh, my fellow co-panelists, uh, I'd like to give some thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, to my two uh, co-editors, Chad and Rashid, uh, of course, to our uh, many authors and contributors who have been involved in this project since the early days and uh, have been a complete pleasure to work with um, in terms of you know, following up with emails, uh, sharing our enthusiasm, actually adding fuel to our enthusiasm at certain points. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with all of you. Um, of course, it's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure as well to work with everyone at Open Book Publishers, um, Alessandra, Laura, Luca, Melissa, Lucy, Francesca. Um, it's so wonderful to see this book in print and the lengthy process through which uh, publishing necessarily is it was always also an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, I think this has been a fantastic collaboration. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the funding agencies which have made this possible. So that includes uh, the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, the NWO, as well as the Erasmus Open Access Funds uh, for further supporting this initiative. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, the staff at Erasmus University Rotterdam for their continued support, and in particular, the Erasmus School for History, Culture, and Communication, where many of us are housed, as well as uh, other supporting bodies such as the Press Office, which has also been very enthusiastic in terms of pushing this topic. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is uh, begin with some questions uh, which we've been uh, working with in terms of uh, some of the relevance of this book. And we're going to proceed in reverse editor order. So as you see sort of the list of names on the book, we're going to work our way up. Uh, so starting with Shan and then Rashid and myself. Uh, I think the first question that Bear is uh, asking is, well, what would you say as, a, as an editor or potentially as an author to encourage someone to read this book or in an ideal scenario to assign or to recommend it to students or to friends or family? Uh, so at this point, I would, um, yeah and the floor over to Shan. Hello, uh, yeah, thank you, Daniel, for the, the presentation uh, to introduce the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I would definitely like to re recommend this book for people and for students who are interested in the topic, um, in a sense that it provides a wide scope, um, the social, cultural, political context, just as um, Daniel said before. Um, it kind of, uh, it brings us a lot of pers different perspectives, uh, especially a lot of underrepresented uh, cultural contexts, um, Slovenia, Morocco, and uh, sometimes like China and Russia. And um, that would be one of the reasons why I think uh, students and people should read it, especially to familiarize themselves with um, the similar phenomenon happening in different social contexts. So another reason I would recommend is um, the, the cross domain of this book is that we are not only talking about vigilantism as a political issue or as a uh, social issue. We are also asking how would that interfere with entertainment? Um, just uh, similarly, just as uh, Daniel said before, it's a lot focused, especially in the first uh, uh, part of the uh, of the authorship. So uh, it's a lot about how entertainment would, uh, would kind of like um, 
interacts with digital vigilantism. And um, when we look at these examples, we understand the complexity of this phenomenon and also um, how things are not really clear cut uh, when we look at um, the similar issues. And I think it will be a great start for people who want to get themselves in to the discussion either academic or social discussion of this uh, relevant topic um, by reading through case studies, but at the same time, we provide a little bit of a theoretical backgrounds uh, and a lot more critical discussion. I would have to echo uh, a lot of the things that have been said already, um, but first of all, I would like to give my thanks, of course, uh, to everybody who contributed and everybody who made the book possible and having been a, serving as a, one of the co-editors for the book has been nothing but pleasure. Every time you reread um, someone's chapter, it wasn't a burden, it was uh, joy because you get to revisit some of the key ideas and each time the chapters would open up from a new perspective. So not only would I recommend reading the book, I would actually recommend reading it several times because sometimes things open up from a new perspective. And plus it offers a variety of um, themes and topics. So you don't have to read it all in one setting, but you can read, start with those that are most relevant to you. And that's the beauty of this book. It's interdisciplinarity. When you are addressing a topic such as digital vigilantism, uh, inevitably you touch upon cases from media, of course, entertainment, media and communication, but also sociology political science, criminology, to an extent even psychology. Furthermore, in the current state, I feel like um, almost in an unprecedented way, we are under ubiquitous watch. Who are we watched by? Well, that's the question, right? But <laughs> the audience is very depending on your own surroundings, professional or personal. But also sometimes we don't even know when or by whom we are being watched. While uh, all of or most of our um, activities, entertainment, education, employment, socialization has been taken online. In this regard, digital vigilantism brings about vulnerabilities and immunities. And that's a topic I would like to touch upon. Of course, you know, many issues come to mind, but to focus on my speech, I would like to focus on these uh, two notions, immunities and vulnerabilities. Whenever we, well, in this regard, anybody in the audience detect, attract, or observe something that we find offensive online, we tend to cancel out the presumption of innocence of a person and operate under the almost unquestionable presumption of guilt. We tend to share the perceived offense with our friend, and by virtue of being endorsed in some form of friendship or reliability, that information then gets spun and shared again. So the person in question, first of all, is deprived of a due process or is deprived of any um, uh, presumption of innocence. Then you might wonder sometimes, well, but they deserve some form of punishment, right? The person is a cat torturer or a pedophile. Uh, you, 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 you just passed around the labels. And some of these cases might be genuinely so. However, other questions come to mind, such as proportionality of retaliation, but also potential abuse of retaliation for political purposes. Having been um, raised under a dictatorial regime in Uzbekistan, uh, for me, these, the idea of the state taking over is constantly present, you see. Uh, and by state, I mean political elites and police that are serving those elites. Because when there are tools to accuse someone and to weaponize visibility to uh, demolish their um, reputation, then, of course, these tools can be used in political perspectives. Therefore, what I notice in the cases that I work with is that people who are vulnerable offline tend to be even more vulnerable online. And vice versa, those who enjoy some immunities, whether through their wealth, or political power offline also tend to withstand um, exposure or denunciations online, let's say when there are anti-corruption investigations and so on. And in this regard, once again, the beauty of the book is that it does bring about all of those different contexts, but also different actors, because we see 
state, we see media, traditional and digital. And we see citizens, Daniel addressed the term citizens, um, but there are different types of citizens, let's say, different clusters of vigilant audiences with different interests and different motivations. Uh, there are those who are serving the interests of the state. There are those who are volunteering their activities. There are those who are also seeking entrepreneurial possibilities because we can make money by virtue of being engaged in public exposure and denunciation, or I might even use the term public execution or public assassination, right? I mean, depending on the context. Again. Therefore, to sum up and to, to leave some room again for questions from the audience, I would say that interdisciplinarity, ubiquity of visibility, and also this contested and ongoing, ongoingly negotiated and renegotiated idea of immunities and vulnerabilities online that are ever so relevant. Thank you. Quickly, uh, building upon uh, these responses as well, um, I think for me, what uh, is very interesting about this book and sharing uh, Rashid's comment about uh, reading and sort of rediscovering what's so interesting about this book. Um, and also, as Shan mentioned, like given sort of the broad range of contexts um, and cases that we address, uh, this is a book that's fundamentally about what happens in this very sort of messy realm between um, seeking diversion, entertainment, and justice seeking. And fundamentally, it's also about the lack of our control over the media. Uh, so as Rashid rightly points out, um, there are some cases within the realm of online justice seeking which seem to kind of be these great equalizers where people who were formerly marginalized have a voice and those who are powerless are able to feel temporarily empowered. As these technologies are further adopted, as the practices are normalized and enter sort of mainstream discourse and parlance, we see this kind of leveling out where those who hold capital, those who hold privilege continue to do so. So this idea of uh, immunities and vulnerabilities, as Richard mentions. mentioned. Um, but what we also see is that even when someone is empowered to speak out, it very quickly becomes much bigger than that single person. So in terms of kind of tracing the actors and tracing notions of attribution, who's responsible, who's sort of the one who initiates some of these cases. Uh, in some of the chapters, uh, in particular, I'm thinking of uh, Tara's account of the uh, Charlottesville uh, backlash and this Twitter account, Yes, You're Racist, is being very pivotal. But of course, it goes much beyond that person. So I think um, in preparing and in, in reading and rereading this book, um, to me, what really strikes out is this notion of you know the potentials of empowerment, but also those limitations to that and how even relatively simple banal cases become much more difficult uh, to, uh, to control and to trace. Um, our second uh, prepared question, um, I think, touches upon this idea that even uh, with uh, a publisher uh, such as uh, Open Book uh, Publishers, who have been um, yeah, very expedient, very wonderful to work with, it's no surprise and no secret that writing a book and getting it sort of in your hands is a lengthy process. And new developments are, of course, worthy of attention. So um, the world's and especially with this sort of volatile media landscape, did not sit still while we were waiting for this book to be released and preparing it. Uh, so one of the questions that we've been also struggling with is, if we had to write this book based on the world of 2020, what will we want to include in addition? Uh, so once again, uh, I'll hand the floor over to Shaq. Thank you. Um, yeah, I believe some of my answers will, uh, will be resonated uh, by my co-editors and even some of the questions already being raised by the audience. So the very obvious answer I will give now um, is that I want to definitely include um, the COVID-related cases. Um, so based on my own experiences, I will focus, I will tell, uh, tell you a little bit more about like the Chinese cases um, related to COVID-19. Um, so the cases that I'm following, and I think we will definitely uh, put some effort and to, uh, to get it out, is that um, there are a lot of Chinese overseas students are now under the scrutiny of their fellow Chinese citizens when they return from foreign countries to China, they will be put on the head of uh, the sinners of the country because they bring back or they possibly or potentially bring back the virus uh, back to China where uh, 
citizens have been sacrificed a lot to try to get out this uh, try to get the country out of this pandemic. Um, so a lot of um, digital vigilantism cases against these uh, students are very visible and uh, sp spread it around by a lot of uh, state media and commercial media in China. Um, so there are cases where um, Chinese students in the quarantine camp, uh, in a quarantine hotel, uh, and their behaviors are being recorded, their complaints are being recorded and then posted online. And uh, they were shamed and named on uh, Sina Weibo, which is an equivalence to Twitter in China. Uh, so those kind of cases, and of course, a lot of uh, the private life um, are under scrutiny in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so that will definitely be something uh, I will I will want to include um, if it's based on 2020 uh, this second year. Um, so um, another thing that I might want to include is uh, more um, kind of echoes with uh, what Simon Drissen wrote is about the fandom, um, especially a lot of cancel cultural and also a lot of escalation of digital vigilantism from the fan war and then move up to the celebrity themselves. This has been a very popular phenomenon, not popular, but uh, yeah, a very prominent phenomenon in these days, uh, especially um, after this uh, very famous case is called the uh, 227 United against Xiao Zhan. Uh, so it is a pop idol who, um, who were punished based on uh, his fans' uh, wrongdoings. I will not elaborate on that too much, but um, in a word, there are a lot of things happening in the fans, um, in the fandom, and also um, those things should be picked up because they are a lot messier. Uh, and it's very, uh, it's not only about entertainment, sometimes they also entangle with politics, entangle with uh, social issues. And that's um, where I want to start it and uh, to kind of poach into the complexity and the messiness of um, this um, phenomenon. This question actually can um, already tackle indeed two questions from the audience, from Esmufi and Rian, about um, whether the cases have increased during COVID-19 or whether we would do things differently now uh, since a little bit of time has passed. I would say that, of course, it's difficult to measure yeah, in the global sense. Have, have, uh, have cases in general increased or not? Because they're thematic. But cases within uh, the theme of COVID-19 um, are quite curious, and I will elaborate on different contexts. The highly digitalized ones, uh, so we should still consider the global digital divides in this regard. There are still quite a few places around the world where conventional surveillance approaches are in place, uh, Central Asian context being one of them. Um, uh, the region that, one of the regions that I also study, and when the COVID was just outbreaking. Uh, there were some of those conventional uh, methods applied. By conventional, I mean a physical police officer sitting in front of your door, ensuring that you don't step outside and no one enters your household because you might contaminate others. Uh, that, of course, was only um, applicable when cases were counted in, in the dozens, but when they went into the hundreds, that was no longer plausible. So the apps became more attractive and where technology allowed uh, the so-called the, the COVID, the Corona app, yeah, depending on where you are, but that should also be considered in the political context of the of a country, and we should keep in mind that hopefully we we will be past this pandemic. Uh, but the measures that are in place, that surveillance mechanisms, the, the CCTV cameras, the vigilance of citizens over each other, and the of course enormous powers which are entrusted to those watching over through apps and so on are likely to stay and to remain in place. Finally, a, an illustrative example about COVID-19 from the context of Uzbekistan, I would share, especially in the very beginning when just the first cases began to appear, uh, the state and the media took measures to protect the identities of individuals. So they were reporting on cases in broad terms, let's say, Okay, five more cases in the capital. However, it was the neighbors when they saw an ambulance coming that would film their neighbor and say, this is so-and-so, this is their name and their address, and that's them that brought us the virus. So the virus was framed as something that is um, brought in by people who travel, 
uh, people who are well off. And again, we see this notion of class struggle, a bit of a uh, economic um, inequalities that come into play where people are upset that, okay, those who have the money to travel abroad, they have the money to go to Europe, they don't sit around, they come back and they also bring the virus. Uh, there were also some anti-Chinese sentiments that circulated. So definitely, unfortunately, these um, cases were present and they would require now reflection and um, assessment uh, and contextualization. However, um, the book already incorporates quite a few, and I'm really happy with the, with the idea of incorporating quite a few contexts. So I'm satisfied with that. Of course, the more we incorporate, the better. So I would only encourage other scholars uh, to pick up the theme, to pick and to include, to try to include those uh, areas that are usually left out from the literature, unfortunately, but also to compare them uh, with contexts that are usually on the radars. Because surprisingly, yeah, it will be a wake-up call. In some in some cases, yeah, you can learn the best case scenarios, but in the other case, you see that the similarities are cross-contextual. No matter what um, you could describe a particular country as, you know, whether it's a kind of seasoned uh, democracy or whether it's a country with a reputation of an autocratic state, some obsession over data, surveillance, vigilance, and incorporation of citizens in the citizen on citizen watch are quite similar. Yeah, and once again, uh, picking up on these responses, um, particularly in 2020, there's um, quite some progressive, uh, but still controversial forms of, yeah, mediated scrutiny and denunciation, which are very much ripping headlines, and in some cases, maybe not getting enough of our attention. So. Uh, the globalization of the hashtag Me Too, um, which is also manifest in particular uh, urban spaces, in particular institutional spaces, uh, the Black Lives Matter movements, um, uh, as well as the sort of further debates around cancel culture, um, which is on the one hand a fairly novel phenomenon, uh, something that I personally learned from our uh, students um, before it really became sort of this thing which was dominating headlines. But at the same time, these debates also line up a lot with um, sort of certain conversations about political correctness and sort of who's included and excluded in those critiques. Uh, of course, you see traces of all of these movements in the cases covered in the chapter, but uh, these have gone on uh, to become even more um, sort of crystallized and present in terms of various public discourses. Um, and of course, um, as uh, everyone's already anticipated, uh, the emergence of corona-based uh, denunciation, uh, which sometimes becomes very xenophobic in nature. Uh, sometimes it's a sort of manifestation of class struggles. Uh, but this, this sort of catch-all term of covid uh, so whether we're talking about people who are hoarding toilet paper back in the early, almost naive days of the pandemic, uh, to conversations about who's having house parties, uh, seeing municipalities, seeing uh, other governments, uh, encouraging this kind of denunciation through tip lines, which of course leak elsewhere, um, we're seeing new conditions of acceptability. So not only are there also new types of offenses, which would have been inconceivable a year ago, uh, but also the, yeah, the kinds of struggles, the kinds of precariousness that people are coping with, the sacrifices that people are making, also fuels this kind of denunciation as well. So the idea that I might be sacrificing holidays with my families, uh, but I see other people not doing that. Uh, that sort of adds, um, yeah, these kind of adds to these conditions as well. So in, in 2020 in the Netherlands, the idea that the Dutch royal family would be a target of this kind of denunciation for going on holidays. Again, that would have been unimaginable, yeah, several months ago. Um, I think that's enough for us for now. I'm going to uh, stop sharing uh, these slides just to facilitate the discussion and hand the floor over to Laura. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for like putting this together. It's been amazing. And thanks for uh, everyone as well. Like do we'll have to leave the comments in the chat please. So before going ahead, I wanted to say, uh, so Daniel uh, Kanye wrote a blog for us a few months ago when the COVID crisis started. And I have to share it on the box. Um, so it's about vigilant audiences and stay at home justice. And it deals a bit with like all of these the COVID situations that we've been talking about and how 
vigilantism has increased in this period and how it has affected us as a society in general. So if you want to have a quick look at it, it's on the chat page, I'd appreciate it. So uh, go into the question. So the first one is, um, do you find like, is this book going to be translated into other languages? So um, do you have any plans for translating the title? Like, if you would like to go ahead of Daniel. Um, I would really enjoy that and support it. Um, I think that's a conversation that we would have to have um, with uh, you fine folks at Open Book Publishers. Um, I think, I would hope that there will be a broader audience for this. Um, so in principle, I would fully support it. I think logistically, that would be a separate conversation, but um, I would love to see that. Yeah, I would like to kind of like shout, have a shout out to like other publishers in China, especially if they're interested, I will be happy to uh, act as a translator <laughs> to translate the whole book into Chinese. <laughs> I will just underline the importance actually of translating because uh, academia, okay, it has quite a few uh, barriers and uh, linguistic barriers are one of the main ones. Yeah, but of course, along with the gender biases that are still present. Uh, geographical biases that are still in place and all other barriers. So I would say that it's a must, in fact, of course, in my very unbiased opinion right now. Uh, but uh, the reason why it's so important is that sometimes in, when you're trying to create discourse or raise awareness or even use some of the key terminology in court hearings, uh, some of these terms are actually lacking. So by translating and by bringing this, uh, this terminology to the discourse, uh, quite a few things can be achieved in the legal spectrum. For instance, the very term vigilantism, and there is a question about terminology, so I hope we get to address that one as well. But the very term entered the Russian, the Russophone discourse, only in July 2019 uh, because of the great work of some of the rights defenders that needed a term to rely upon when they tried to help victims of digital vigilantism or when they try to operationalize terminology in course. So many other reasons aside, I would say that one of them is um, this kind of legal reasons, terminological reasons, but also, of course, the valorization of knowledge and sharing it because the book is open access. It should also be available in different languages. Thank you so much. And yes, of course, like since the book is to be wise, is there anyone who wants to contact them or is interested in, in the translation? Maybe even us. I can say myself, but definitely a really interesting book that should be out there like in many languages as we can. <laughs> uh, so another question that we have is from Anna. So Anna asks, um, how do you define the concept of vigilantism also in relation to the existing literature on neo-vigilantism? And following that, like um, she would like to know more about the online research methodology that you use and um, how you link the online and offline realms in that sense. So a bit of like a lot of questions there, but I can go back to them if you need to. So um, I think we're starting with Sean, if that's okay. So do you have any thoughts on that or? Uh, yeah, I think maybe the definition question should be uh, best answered by Daniel. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so let's get with Daniel then. Sure, just answering that very quickly, um, we draw upon um, some existing definitions on conventional vigilantism, such as that of Les Johnston, uh, but also Eduardo uh, Ancanda. Um, so using those as sort of a yeah basis for comparison. Um, but this is also something that uh, as this has developed over time, we've kind of reconsidered some of our earlier assumptions. Um, so yeah, that's this is something that's addressed to some degree in the opening pages. Um, I'm just going to very quickly turn on the light because the sun is setting. I realize I'm going to fade from existence if I don't do that soon. Uh, so I'll hand the floor uh, to my uh, co-editors. Also, I should note that uh, some of our um, co-authors and contributors are also in the audience. So um, they're also obviously welcome to uh, answer some of these questions as well. I will try to answer the question about the methodology then. Uh, so basically, um, most of our methodologies will come as like a, a combination of, uh, of tools. So one thing that we're looking at is the media discourse. Uh, and then we are collecting news reports and uh, media coverages about uh, specific cases and then doing discourse analysis about this uh, about this media coverage. Another set of data we're looking at would be the public discourses. So how people post on social media platforms, how they comment, um, these type of thing. So we also uh, collect these type of data and analyze them. And of course, we're trying to get some interviews with um, the participants, with the 
uh, the victims and with uh, people who might get involved, for example, police or uh, lawyers. So these type of people, uh, all these type of actors, we uh, try to get interview with them. So in my own case, it's it, it proves to be a little bit hard, uh, especially when it comes to government and police, because I can't really get a hold of them uh, in the Chinese context. Um, but yeah, <laughs> this is how we um, op operationalize our uh, research. In in terms of the uh, terminological considerations. Interestingly enough, around four years ago, when we were just joining the, pro the project, uh, which was designed by Daniel, uh, the, this is when my first exposure to actual term vigilantism uh, took place. And I translated it into Russian, and I looked at, you know, just to, to try to comprehend it. And the thing is, uh, amid other terms that are out there that you, that you have listed in your question, um, vigilantism, having been working on it for four years now, now, after four years, I understand its significance, actually, because even in literature, it, it is still being addressed, right? There, there, were, there were gaps of 20-some years between each time somebody tried to tackle even the conventional notion of vigilantism uh, and tried to conceptualize it. Moreover, now we have the digitalized layer on it. Uh, but the reason why it is important, the particular... Um, so to take the conventional vigilantism and to operationalize that in the digital context, uh, because of the different considerations such as organization and repertoire and so on, that participants operationalize in their activities. That separates it from all other uh, terminological categories like online bullying or online harassment or trolling and so on, because there is this notion of organization, there is a notion of theme, or a perceived offense, or uh, which incorporate crossing of morality, the boundaries of morality, perceived morality, or boundaries of law, in fact, or the, the perceived, of course, uh, violation of those boundaries. As far as methodology, again, so when we were designing the process, the project, we had to um, consider its interdisciplinarity and address it from a variety of perspectives. Of course, a lot of artifacts are coming from the internet, right? So online, you can do media content analysis, you can do ethnography, kind of netnography, right? You look at these groups, you try to see how they're operationalizing. You are studying these communities. Uh, sometimes these cases of vigilantism are spontaneous, right? You never know how things are going to spawn around or whether they will be picked up by the media and go viral or whether they will die out the next day. But other times they're highly organized and institutionalized by groups that are focusing on, on thematic cases. So I studied those groups in kind of ethnographic terms. I also incorporated good old interviews. I went to Russia on several occasions and I interviewed participants. I tried to interview uh, victims where possible, again, with ethical consideration of not bringing any harms to people who already experience harm by means of disability and exposure. I uh, spoke with police where possible, spoke with state representatives and journalists, uh, those and rights defenders and people who actually take up cases in courts. And it, it was a bit kind of along the way, the lines of grounded theory. We w went in sort of with a blank page and tried to fill it with information we were ga gathering from the informants. A lot of things had to be done in parallel, simultaneously. Parallel to that, we would meet almost in, initially every week and try to discuss cases, try to build up conceptual uh, frames. And at the same time, of course, the ongoing process of media content analysis, both the traditional media as a powerful tool in rendering digital vigilantism meaningful in this sense. Yes, the way traditional media tackle the issue is very important. Do they sort of intentionally or unintentionally assist participants by further exposing the targets? Do they give an opportunity for the target to tell their side of the story or not? And so on. Maybe just quickly to illustrate this from sort of abstract terms to a more concrete and vivid one. One of the cases that I studied concerned uh, honor beating of females in Russia within a migrant group, within my labor migrants from Kyrgyzstan. So the males take offense when females are seen in public with non-Kyrgyz men. They feel like they're betraying their motherland. 
and they retaliate on these women by performing degrading acts over them, but they also film the process and they share it online. Of course, when someone is doing things to your body that's terrible and awful, that is punished in Foucauldian terminology, that is the punishment of the body in the spectacle of punishment. But when the process is filmed and put online, they're also kind of damaging your soul in the sense of demolishing your reputation, your dignity, and so on, and delivering the message back home that people see that, okay, you are a female, you are in migration, you are already vulnerable, there is a lot of prejudice over you, especially in this kind of conservative context. And plus, you are framed as the betrayer of the motherland. What is the media response to that? Are the journalists taking any measures to protect identities of women? How are they framed as victims? Or as um, actually, is there some victim blaming? Unfortunately, the latter is often true. Uh, and who is giving voice? Or again, who is invited to comment on these things? Who is invited to talk shows as a specialist? Is it the researchers? Is it the victims? Is it the rights defenders? Or is it the perpetrators themselves? Thank you so much for that. Uh, so continuing to our next question, which is also related to terminology. Uh, so uh, it's from Liana. So thank you so much for the question, Liana. So uh, is, um, people use a variety of terms to refer to vigilantism online, such as net, 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 sorry, this one is a difficult one, netlantism, there we go, uh, digital vigilantism, cyber vigilantism, and digilantism. So what do you see the difference in these terms are, and uh, what are your thoughts on the importance or unimportance of um, terminological coherence? Um, just very quickly, um, coming originally from surveillance studies, so the, the study of surveillance practices and anchoring a lot of our work on Foucault and the Panopticon, we dealt with so many different opticons, so many different renditions of like social peer-to-peer -peer lateral surveillance, participatory surveillance. Um, and you can, I, I, especially within that realm, I appreciate the nuances, but I think it's useful to not get lost in that. Um, I think this is certainly the case with digital vigilantism and all of these sort of uh, synonyms. And I think that, especially when talking about a phenomenon which has changed dramatically over time uh, in various contexts, I mean, just within the Chinese context, the human flesh search engine, comparing it from 2008 to 2018, I think Shan could say a lot more about that. Um, it's such a volatile practice that um, as much as it's nice to be consistent in terms of the use of Terminology. I think what we wrote about this in 2015 or, or before, um, you know, it, it's a ch changing landscape. So I'm, I think, very omnivorous when it comes to uh, the use of these terms and looking at the works of authors who have used these other terms. Um, and from that derive certain typologies or, or certain questions. I think it's, yeah, I am, for me, policing these boundaries is not at all productive. And in fact, if I'm honest, the term digital vigilantism is a bit of a mouthful. Um, these all terms all are a bit of a mouthful. So um, sometimes I feel like we're kind of shackled to this term, which we all kind of struggle with. So I think playing with some of the synonyms is also really useful in terms of the meaning making process and being attentive to how it's described beyond academic circles. Yeah, indeed. I think um, a lot of these terminologies were uh, brought up in a certain uh, context or in a historical kind of settings when uh, there were, a, for example, like the, this word cyber vigilantism is definitely uh, coming up when there uh, was a very heavy focus on the cyber space. Uh, so you will see this historical context happening uh, in the terminologies, uh, which I agree with Daniel that we I don't think we should police this boundary of the terminology using. Uh, so try to pull it back a little bit from my own uh, experience and perspective. That is, uh, to be honest, this word is not really translatable into Chinese directly. Uh, I can't really find a co completely comparable term in Chinese. So in a lot of senses, I refer to my research as I'm doing research uh, in this human flat search, which in Chinese is called Renro Sou Su. It sounds horrible. It sounds very graphic. Um, but that means that you are searching on the information, you're searching the information uh, by 
powered by human resources instead of the search engines. So that is uh, the meaning of it. And another term that I often refer to is online justice. Uh, it, in Chinese, it's called wang luo zheng yi. So uh, that also captures a lot of the uh, things we're doing here. But of course, there are always this kind of uh, um, discrep discrepancies or s like tiny differences in different terminology using. Uh, but I would say that um, as long as people are interested in this topic, interested in uh, the cases, uh, I think that it's already a wonderful thing. The core for me, uh, I would still still remains the, the term vigilantism, whether you apply cyber or digital or online, that doesn't matter as much um, because it will depend on yeah, whether you are considering purely kind of doxing and so on and hacking those kind of purely cyber types of vigilantism or that you're looking more at mediated ones than a different kind of uh, preceding term applies here. For me, the core is to continue the discussion on what is this, uh, what, incorpor what is incorporated, what is, what is packed into the term vigilantism in the sense of, yes, it is citizen-led justice, uh, although uh, who leads citizens and motivations and so on and the audiences, all of these things come into play. So it's not as much, once again, just to underline, it's not as much about online or cyber or digital. It's more about, okay, there is vigilantism. Let's unpack it and then let's see um, context-specific practices. And then maybe you can even interplay with the terminology. Also, I have been peeking kind of at the chat room and it's so nice to see people um, leaving warm comments. Thank you all so much for such a great feedback. It really it feels really good on this uh lockdown evening yeah is good thank you so much thank you so much everyone so we're continuing as well like thanks a lot for all the nice comments that you live in on the box i'm sure the co-editors and the contributors are out here are really happy to to hear your feedback so thanks again for that uh so next one um is that would you consider digital vigilantism purely problematic that there should be awareness against it or can it exist in our society if executed in a constructive manner um, answering this very quickly, I think there obviously is the potential for constructive and progressive uses, uh, including some of the cases we've already discussed. I mean, torch-bearing Nazis, denouncing them, to me, seems a very self-evident instance of this. Likewise, with the awareness raising um, or sort of using these means uh, to prevent the worst instances of uh, pandemic-related deaths, um, of course, people will be harmed in these processes, and there's always the potential for abuse, even in terms of the lessons learned after these cases. Um, there's always that potential for uh, for the milk to go sour, shall we say, or for like the the further weaponization or the the instrumentalization of progressive tactics for repressive harms. Um, an example of this is um, most social media platforms give you the option to like report hate speech. Or to report abuse, that's of course a good thing to minimize abuse, to minimize hate speech. But those mechanisms can also be sort of picked up in a harmful way. So I think there is absolutely, uh, uncontestedly, um, evidence of progressive use of these tools. But that's sadly never the end of that story. For me, I think um, it's we we should always be uh, conscious and we should always be cautious about the using of digital vigilantism, no matter what, uh, no matter whether the cause is progressive or not. Um, we still need to be very careful with um, the use of it because um, we're talking about individuals uh, online. And um, in Chinese, we have like this term uh, that has been kind of popular these days. It's called socially dead. Uh, so basically, we are uh, by using digital vigilantism, we are causing people socially dead. Uh, so no matter whether it is it is progressive or it is uh, conservative or it's harmful, we still need to be very careful with that. Uh, and for me, I see this um, this as a spectrum, to be honest. So um, you can be extremely progressive, like there's no wrong to be uh, put on that, uh, put on the course you're, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're getting at, and there will be like a completely negative one. But there are also a lot of messy ones in the middle that we can't really put our finger on it. Um, so I would say, uh, yeah, my general idea would be always be cautious and, um, yeah. Uh, in my research, I defined 
three clusters of vigilante activities. One cluster is pro-state and state endorsed, and that is in the context of Russia. These are youth activists, you know, that are kind of loyal to the Kremlin. They have received money from the state for their activities, and they have been pursuing their political and financial, social, and other ambitions through this kind of activism. Second cluster I identified as the one working in spite of the state. Yeah, just kind of parallel to the state, almost criminal sometimes, um, although there are cases where criminal, openly criminal groups have collaborated with police officers. But these are the above mentioned male groups that are engaging in this kind of activities. They are also people attacking, you know, um, perceived pedophiles, although in the Russian context, Pedophilia is usually confused with homosexuality or any deviation from heterosexual relations. Uh, and then once you are vulnerable, especially in the context of conservatism and the renaissance of the Orthodox Church and dysfunctionality of the law and dysfunctionality of um, legal mechanisms, then you are in trouble. You know, and that, that, that to me was the kind of like the most painful aspect of doing this research when you see that when people become victim, they're so limited in their options for seeking justice, especially when they're already vulnerable, a female, a migrant, a sexual minority. And when, when a person brings all these three identities at once, they're, they're vulnerable to five, six, seven different groups. And when they come to police and say, I have been denounced online because I'm accused of being a pedophile, well, chances are police will also take advantage of them and start. Uh, blackmailing and start you know trying to extract money from them or otherwise abusing them and that is terrible females female migrants don't go to police because they are feared of being deported furthermore it's a psychological issue you come and you have to re recite seven times your story you tell seven times what happened to you you write it on paper and what is the end of it a hooliganism case will be applied to perpetrators and they will be fined three or five euros you have relived through hell seven times, but at the end of the day, no justice has been found. Yet a third cluster that I identified, and these are kind of, well, to put it in simple terms, like the good guys, right? The people who are, who are struggling for greater social good. Uh, one of the recent examples comes from um, Kyrgyzstan, another dear country to me come from Central Asia. There was a political turmoil recently, and following a coup, Looters took it to the streets and started, you know, attacking, um, looting uh, state buildings and businesses and so on. And it was the citizens who organized themselves in sort of this romanticized vigilante force where citizens come together to protect state property, to protect businesses, to protect each other. Yeah, people stood as a living shield to protect the city from the looters. Um, so you have those kind of cases as well, but the majority, unfortunately, are not that last case. The majority are highly politicized uh, and filled with other types of biases, with gendered biases, with nationalist, ethnic biases. And in those relations, in those new negotiations of intra-citizen relations, unfortunately, especially projecting into the future, I see that more and more discussions are necessary, reflecting on everyday interactions that we have now with any service. You give each other stars. You took a taxi, you give a star, one or five. You know, you received any kind of service. You even sold something on, through Facebook on Marktplatz, uh, kind of an informal market, gray market, I don't know, on Facebook. And you give a star to the seller while they give a star or five to the purchaser. If we are turning into the society or where, which is constantly raiding each other with the potential of exposure to the audience of how terrible their interaction was, even these small purchases, that otherwise would have gone unnoticed. To me, that is something worth focusing on because that can be very dangerous, especially once again, given that these ethnic, national, gendered and other flaws and biases tend to come to surface in these relations. Thank you so much. Sarah, next question is actually quite um, related to what you've been talking uh, Rishi, so about like the use of the police that unfortunately these examples, well, the examples that you, you told us are a bit like 
negative in this case. But the um, the audience staff has asked about like um can you see any ways that we can utilize the elements of vigilant of vigilantism in this case uh, for a good alongside or slash alongside the police? I know this that the first case that we've been talking about has been it's been a bit quite negative in this sense. In some countries, it varies a lot, and depending on what social structure there is or what yeah social uh, parameters are measured. So, if you have any anything you'd like to add, either Rashid or also uh, Shannon Daniel, if you would like to build upon that. I will go. Uh, so for me, yeah, indeed, especially in China, there are a lot of cases we are regarding it as uh, progressive or uh, the good guys, uh, especially in the um, in an early, uh, no, in a late 2000s. Uh, so like 2008, 2009, until 2013, there were a lot of cases that uh, when citizens expose corrupted officials in China, um, they use various uh, ways. So by looking at the media photos they have taken to find out that, oh, this guy have 11 different luxurious watches or different uh, Gucci belts, which is beyond their payroll. Uh, and then they start to duck, uh, try to dig more about uh, this specific official. So there were a lot of officials corrupted that were taken down. Uh, by the government because of this uh, digital vigilantism. So, of course, it can be very progressive. And once again, go back to the Me Too movements. It's also huge in China. There were a lot of exposure about um, important people in the publishing industry, in the uh, in the news industry, and also in NGOs uh, who are um, exploiting and also abusing their female staffs uh, have been exposed. And I would say that is definitely for the good causes. Um, yeah, but back to what I said before, it's still a tool that should be used carefully and we should not um, praise it too much uh, in terms of the tool using, not because of the costs. I think the causes are really good, are great, and uh, we should push on for it. Um, but in terms of the tool they're using, we should be cautious um, because we are really um, how to say, we are not really giving too much other options for the people who are being attacked um, in this case. Yeah, I think touching upon these notions of ideology, power, and politics in terms of these uh, police um, partnerships uh, with civilians, it, it becomes a very messy topic, but even with a very sort of relatively sort of ideologically not neutral, but maybe a bit more contained uh, notion of like data protection. So having certain collaborations where information rather than being doxxed sort of to the general public is routed to supposedly trusted authorities. We can see instances of how that goes awry. So if uh, a police agency makes an appeal on Twitter and says, do you have any information about this case? Please send it to this hotline or to this tip line. Uh, of course, people can then reply in the comments, and that can go out of control. This police account may then disable comments on their Twitter thread, and then people will retweet it or remediate it to another platform. So in seeking to mobilize the public, and again, we can think of a number of examples where uh, you would see that as a beneficial thing, especially during rather exceptional times, there is always that potential for abuse, either immediately you know, during sort of uh, case or long afterwards. Um, so yeah, in terms of manipulation, in terms of further harassment, um, even in instances that we would see as fairly progressive or fairly necessary, there's always going to be that sort of that asterisk next to the case that shows, well, yeah, things can still get a bit messy. Thank First you, example sir. that comes to mind is the uh, Boston Marathon, of course, and when the police solicited the help of the audiences and what kind of unfortunate scenarios that brought about uh, one is example of a third cluster when the citizens organize themselves to kind of counter the dysfunctional state comes from Russia and that's the anti-corruption foundation so because um, the ruling elites let's say have appropriated um, resources <laughs> the anti-corruption foundation is revealing these appropriations right so they can fly the drones over property of the politicians and reveal and expose them. Here, however, the, again comes the idea of um, mm, different capacities and asymmetries in these capacities, including those rendered by platforms. 
because sometimes the platforms can mute or uh, remove or block content and whose content is being blocked. Is it the revealing sides? Well, like, again, to ground it on, on actual concrete examples in the case of Russia, where you have uh, you know people being beaten up with humiliated with the uh, you know hair shaved off and smothered in paint and so on because they are accused of pedophilia that is filmed and circulating freely on youtube and across other platforms or you have a case where a group of citizens expose properties or secret meetings of politicians with the oligarchs and on the yachts and so on and then a platform like instagram removes that content based on concerns over privacy so whose privacy is guarded in this regard and who, to whom is the priority given and of course there is a role to play for these kind of global platforms but there are also local platforms that are even more popular like Vkontakte in the case of Russia which is a prototype of Facebook and if you have a local platform domestic platform that is forced to in one way or another collaborate with the state either through direct ownership or through indirect loyalty or through pressure and uh, threatening of being thrown out of the market, then a different uh, layer of questions also comes up. And again, that, that brings me back to my question of uh, immunities and vulnerabilities. But sometimes positive things happen, of course, and maybe we should emphasize those. We should never forget about you know what the world has experienced this recently with the waves of protests but also discussions and important paradigm shifts with black lives matter with me too movements and even though they're not universally embraced the shift of otherwise uh, stagnant plateaus is already important thank you so much so we have uh, what i believe is the final question we have for today so it relates a bit to Everything we've been talking to, everything is quite interconnected. So, um, it's um, so as we move into a world with greater and greater AI um, slash bot activity, do the various um, uh, theoretical frameworks to understand digital vigilantism need any sort of revision to accommodate for non-human forms uh, of agency in action, scale, etc.? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in terms of mapping out. Um, yeah, the, the various actors involved. So even when talking about vigilant audiences, vigilant citizens, it's never just about the citizens. And that goes back to sort of conventional vigilantism. The state has always had sort of an uneasy, uh, albeit productive, relationship with these kinds of entities. Uh, so the opening example of the tabloid press is another instance of this. Of course, these are actual people with you know, political interests, et cetera, uh, stoking the flames. Uh, the increased role of AI and algorithms in all aspects of our lives, I think we can't afford to ignore that, nor can we afford to ignore the fact that these technologies tend to be politically, culturally, and ideologically situated. So we, so too shouldn't we use an emphasis on these technologies as an excuse to sort of obviate uh, the ideological configuration, the idea that uh, these seemingly neutral technologies still reflect certain interests. So I think it will be very interesting to see this develop and to be attentive to that. Um, but I think once again, we will see the reproduction of existing relations as opposed to, at least in the long run, um, these kinds of um, sort of upsetting of existing sort of political hierarchies, uh, et cetera. Yeah, definitely. Looking into platforms are uh, already, like are definitely a very big part of our, our research, especially to look at not only how specific features or technologies are affording a certain things, but also the complete logic behind the social media platforms. Uh, so a lot of the Chinese digital vigilantism cases are happening uh, on Xina Weibo, and they have this uh, whole mechanism called uh, Rezo, which means trending topics. I mean, like similar to uh, to Twitter as well. But the problem is that uh, on Xina Weibo, you can buy a trending topic. Uh, so you can pay amount of money to Xina Weibo, and then they will push you up uh, to the ladder of the trending topics. And of course, a lot of fans or a lot of like um, citizens are familiar with uh, the, the charts and they are like, they're used this kind of media literacy to hype up a certain uh, topics that they want to be trending. Um, and uh, by looking at the whole 
uh, economy and also the logic how social media platform runs, which is attention, which is um, traffics. Um, that definitely plays a very important part into uh, whether a specific incident, whether a digital vigilante uh, activity can gain pop, uh, can gain popularity or gain traffic. Uh, that plays a very important part of it. And uh, yeah, definitely um, not only the AI, but also the logic uh, should be studied um, in this uh, when, when, a tackle, uh, when tackle this uh, kind of issues. And maybe just a quick remark on this, uh, not to repeat what has been said. I'll take a bit of a different shift here with um, filter bubbles and maybe these kind of suggestions online. Yeah, the algorithms giving you, feeding you what is relevant and so on. So in one of the study that we conducted together with Daniel, we looked at the community construction online and the role of both algorithms in that sense. You know, when you are suggested something, hey, join this, this might be of interest to you. Uh, and you join the group based on kind of perceived shared interest and you suddenly become a community within which is kind of a small kingdom of an admin or admins, right? Because admins uh, filter information. They have the right to kind of handpick and kick out people or approve their presence in the community. And when you have suddenly 15,000 people connected online through a shared team, whatever it might be, uh, we love cats or we... Uh, hate migrants, you know, the, the variety of thematic, thematic groups and people socialize there, uh, maybe without a chance to challenge their own ideas or to challenge ideas of others. Be because when you come in and you try to post something um, that challenges the approved discourse, you might be muted and thrown out. So again, there is this idea of being muted both by the platforms, but also physical by uh, admin or admins. And generally, that brings us back to this idea of kind of public sphere in a digital domain. Are we suddenly on this virtual central square of a city where we all can come and voice our concerns? Or are there a few that are on one square, a few on the other, and so on, and we're in these segments and fragments and um, sort of socializing within already pre-existing ideas and never being challenged. So th that, is, that is one way we looked at the, at the notion also. Thank you so much. So we've got going um, one last question that I do have in the audience. So uh, it's been asked, are you planning to have a second edition by including all the new ideas you just mentioned uh, throughout this presentation? Uh, yeah, so this was something that we had not yet discussed. Um, so Rashid, Chan, and I, um, as part of our commitment to um, our, our five-year project, are currently preparing um, a manuscript that's sort of addressing some of these overarching themes, but also being attentive to the cases that have emerged uh, recently. Uh, that will be something that we will join the author. It's at the stage where it's basically a Google document that we're sort of playing around with back and forth. Uh, we don't have a publisher yet, um, but uh, based on our good experiences with uh, open book publishers, this could be a potential conversation. Um, it's been such a pleasure working with authors around the world and across disciplines on this topic, and I think that's something that we would love to continue. Uh, so I think my message to anybody who wants to write on this and would like to collaborate, uh, please send us uh, an email. Um, and if there's interest and if there's a momentum to have a second edition or further collaborative work on this topic, um, we will certainly uh, love to find time for that. And of course, I'm yeah, not speaking on behalf of my co-authors like, and, and co-editors. Um, if they're fed up with this, that's obviously fine too. I think there's some, some thumbs up in there uh, from Jen, so quick, <laughs> and from Rashid as well. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everyone who attended today. Thank you to the Curtis for like, putting together this um, nice presentation about this fantastic book. Uh, so quickly, this book is an open access title, so it is available to read on our website for free and to download as well. So is there, I just, I'm gonna send it through the chat, but it's um, open book publishers slash project slash uh, 1151. Also, this um, this uh, book lunch will be available on YouTube as well, so you can just rewatch it, go over the questions. If you have some particular queries that you would like to share with the author, my email is in the open book publishers page, or you can just contact me directly if you know them, of course, I'm not gonna uh, intervene in that. But yeah, again, thank you so much, Jan, uh, Daniel and Rashid for being with me today. It's been fantastic and we will be delighted. I mean, I can't speak for like, 
proper approvals, but I'll be delighted to work with you again anytime. And um, yeah, thank you. Likewise, thank you. And uh, yeah, I hope we have the chance to collaborate in the future. Um, thank you everyone for your time. And